class, huh? Thank you. All right. My name is Tina Mendez. And if you're out there, would you please just say hi into the chat for Matt so you can see everybody who's out here before we get started or a good afternoon or a good morning, wherever you are, or you can wave in your little Zoom window. And what I want to do is just say that I'm honored to introduce our invited DEI speaker to the colloquium today. I am really excited to introduce Matt Cover because we both really began our STEM careers as graduate students in the Rush Lab nearly 20 years ago now. You can actually see a lot of the Rush Lab members here in this room. Matt is now a professor at CSU Stanislaus where he teaches biology and ecology and researches with his undergraduates and master's students about Mediterranean climate streams, aquatic insects, population genetics, and sometimes anything they're interested in that intersects with his interests. He's a great collaborator and worker engaged with the goal of building environments where stu students minoritized in STEM can succeed. He's the recipient of an NSF award for professional development of biology, of biology department faculty at Stan State. And six of us here in this room are for fortunate to be collaborating with him funded on a seed grant from the California Education Learning Labs as part of a team with CSU, three community colleges at Berkeley to build instructional tools to improve biology education. And it's really focused on collaboration and sense of belonging, which really I think matches with his talk today. Before he gets started, I wanted to tell you a little story to illustrate Matt's engagement and attention to experiences for his students. Every year, the Rush Lab alumni meet up at a local biomonitoring conference, freshwater ecology conference in Davis, and most of us get there on the first day. And everyone says, where's Matt? Says, where's Matt? We send him some texts. He writes back. He says, I'm almost there. I'm almost there. And a little later, he rolls up with a rented van of sometimes 10 Stan State biology students. And his students attend talks, they meet everyone, present group posters of their research, and everyone has a great time. And then they all hop right back into the van to make it back for the rest of their classes. And this happens every year. So with that, I will let um, Vince give, give his part of the introduction and get to say a few words. But I really um, am excited to have him talk about um, his work today on challenging privilege agreements in STEM culture. But, all right, Vince. Thank you so much, Tina. Well, I, I could just add, you know, Matt was really a wonderful graduate student. He uh, came with a geology background, which was very, very important because he did his work up on the Klamath River, which is a very, very hot area right now with dam removal and, and everything. And he was looking at the uh, landslides and sedimentation effects, really a very, very much looking at biology from a geological point of view. And it was a great dissertation, several fabulous uh, publications came out of it. And uh, he was uh, stayed in the lab for a little longer and then got this great position at Stanislaus, Stanislaus State, where he's really done wonderful things. And it's wonderful to see him. Uh, I always think of Matt in a whenever I'd, I'd be worried about something, he'd say, I got it. I got it. Don't worry. That's uh, the number one expression I associate with him. So thank you, Matt. And welcome back to Berkeley. Thank you so much, Vince. Thank you, Tina. It was such a warm welcome. I'm so um... Humble to be here and, and it just, it's heartwarming to see all of you again and see all these new faces. Uh, people hope to meet in person someday. And thank you, uh, Mateo, for the invitation and, and whoever else uh, made this happen. I'm, I'm, I'm floored, I'm honored to be here. Um, yeah, shout out to, to all the old colleagues and, and new colleagues and friends, uh, the social team, um, of course, the Rush Lab, it's great to see you all. And uh, as well as other freshwater folks uh, at Berkeley, I see Ted and Stephanie and Robin and uh, thank you. Thanks for being here. All right, before, let me uh, take that important step of sharing my screen, make sure I can do that. Let's try it like that and like that. How does that look? Great. Good. All right. Um, okay. Well, yeah. Thank you again. Um, I come here today not as a as an expert in social justice education, but as a learner. Um, I'm really excited to share with you some of what I've been uh, working on uh, in my classes and thinking about with other colleagues. 
Um, I'm going to ask um, you to use the chat a few times throughout this presentation to, to share your thoughts and ideas. And that reminds me I need to make sure I have that available so I can see it. Even with two screens, there's a lot going on here, a lot to juggle. All right, just like teaching. Um, so my professional life the past dozen years since I've been at Stan State has been defined by my work with undergraduate students. And it's really the students who are, um, you know, my motivation and, and really my, my greatest teachers. So I wanted to start, start there. Um, let's see. Okay, so I'm coming to you today. Uh, I'm from my home in Oakland uh, in the Sasso Creek watershed, uh, which is in the territory of Huqian on Ohlone land. I also want to recognize that my own institution of Cal State Stanislaus is located on the unceded lands of the Yokut Nation in the northern San Joaquin Valley. And because I'm, um, I, I tend to think in a kind of a geographic perspective and, and trying to be grounded in places, I wonder if you all could share where you're joining from today and whatever level of detail, whatever level of specificity uh, you feel comfortable in the chat, especially those of you in the East Bay and Berkeley. Feel free to give streets or neighborhoods or anything along those lines. Of course, love to hear if you know the um, indigenous land that you're upon as well. Wonderful, thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone. So as you're as you're sharing your your geographies of place, um, I wanted to. It, it really helps me. Oh wow, Deep Springs College. Wonderful. Um, I wanted to start with this idea of kind of our geographic distance between us all as a metaphor for how each of us might be coming to the idea of social justice education. And I just really love this idea um, that Eve Tuck and Wayne Yang write about. They write about the rising sign of social justice and that for many of us, we're born under this, this sign, um, even though we may in our work take many different paths. And so uh, they write about that rather than focusing on the distance between us, in this case, the metaphor, the geographic distance, we can um, recognize that when we're under this constellation of social justice, high up in the sky, uh, if we look at, if we consider the angle, the inner angle between each of our locations and this constellation, it's actually quite small. So we may be close, we may be far away um, in our views, but it's possible that we can come together today to collaborate around these issues, even if we end up diverging later on. Um, and I wanted to return to this idea of land, the land that uh, many of us are on uh, for thousands of years. At least John Ohlone people have lived on the land now known as the East Bay, and they've cultivated a reciprocal relationship with the land They've survived uh, the atrocities of uh, colonization that began with the Spanish mission system and continued with the genocidal policies of the United States. So like many of you, I'm a settler on this land um, and part of the continued colonization of the Ohlone land and people. Um, so I wanted to highlight some of the work of the Sogorea Te Land Trust. And if you're not familiar with their work, I encourage you to check out their website. Um, this was established by urban indigenous women uh, of the Ohlone people, and they work to return indigenous land to indigenous people. Um, some of you may already be uh, aware of their um, process of uh, paying shumi, which is a land tax for settlers, but if not, I encourage you to check that out on their website. So whenever I go through this process of trying to acknowledge and honor indigenous people and their deep relation to land and confront that the world is founded upon the theft of land. Um, this is extremely discomforting for me. It may be discomforting for you as well. 
I want to just stay in the space of discomfort for one more minute because um, I think it's important that we learn not to just to acknowledge its facts, but also consider how we can build respectful and reciprocal relationships. So in the topic of my presentation today, um, I think this is relevant. The continuing process of settler colonialism has implications for our work as educators and our work in academia. Um, going back to Tuck and Yang, they have told us that um, decolonization is not a metaphor. And so I want to think for a minute about what does that mean for those of us who are working on educational institutions uh, on indigenous land, such as UC Berkeley and my own institution, Cal State Stanislaus. These institutions have been integral to the project of replacement. And when we really assert ourselves in that, in that position, I think we, we can begin to question what social justice might look like in the teaching and learning that happens at land grant institutions. And so two questions that come to mind for me, um, what does it mean that our institutions were designed for settler colonizers, mainly for privileged white men? And when we, we tend to apply these deficit mindsets to students, we talk about the underrepresented minority learning gap but if we're in this place of recognizing the colonization that's gone on, we can, we can consider switching that. And we can actually recognize it's our institutions, our curriculum and our pedagogies that are deficient. So that's, that's gonna be the focus of my talk today. Um, if you'll indulge me for just a few more, more minutes, I wanted to kind of give you um, a little bit of a story about my own path. Um, and UC Berkeley is integral to that path. So um, I've been going old through old photos. Um, my father died in December. And so it's been a process last few months of um, thinking, about, thinking about my past, my history, my family. So these were um, photos from graduation day, 2002, the Earth and Planetary Science Department. Um, and it, it brought up a lot of, a lot of memories for me. Um, I thought about how the first few years of my undergraduate at Cal, I really, really struggled. I, I, felt, I felt lost. Um, I was taking large classes, um, you know, physics in Lacan Hall and, and chemistry and uh, calculus and, and really struggling. I was, a, I was a C student the first few years. Um, and so I really do think it was finding this particular program in uh, Earth Planetary Science, which is an incredibly small program at that time. I, I still remember there were more, more faculty than there were undergraduate students in the program. And so that meant lots of small classes. It meant hands-on learning. It meant, uh, it meant research opportunities, um, paid research positions for undergraduates. And I think this is really what, what saved me. What, um, I don't think I would have been successful at all in academia without this kind of, of focus. I also want to call out, um, I think my favorite course that I took as an undergraduate was an ESPM course. Um, it was a, a course on methods in soil science. It was team taught by Mary Firestone, Harvey Donner, uh, Masood Gudrati, and the GSI was Brandy Toner. And, and this is such a meaningful course for me. The first half was structured uh, as learning about methods in soil physics, soil chemistry, soil microbiology. And the second half was a chance to put those into practice in our own research project. And it was that kind of experience that got me excited again about science and helped me realize um, what I wanted to do. Um, and so I'm, I'm setting that up as, as part of, um, that this, this has greatly influenced my pedagogy, um, these experiences in, in my undergraduate. So um, fast forward to graduate school. Um, I was so privileged to be able to join ESPM and especially to join uh, the Resch Lab. Um, I couldn't have had a better, a better experience um, and, and just so happy that so many of you are here today. Um, Tina and Allison are here. Um, of course, Vince. Uh, Christine May is the woman on the uh, lower left in this photo. She was a postdoc at that time. Um, really instrumental in, in helping me learn to become a, a field ecologist, environmental scientist. 
Um, and let's see, uh, I see Igor in the audience um, and, and others, Kevin Lundy, Wendy Renz, Chris Solek, um, Leah Besh, um, they're just wonderful colleagues and wonderful friends. Um, one of the, I think the biggest gifts that Vitz gave me, um, and, I, and I wonder if he would remember this um, or realize how significant it was for me. Um, he allowed me to serve as a lead instructor for a class um, that we called Methods in Stream Ecology. This was a small class um, for undergraduates. I think each, you know, we offered it twice, and I think each time had about a dozen students. But this was a really formative experience for me as an educator. It was a chance to try to put some of these ideas about the importance of hands-on applied instruction um, in a small class into practice. And I think it was really essential um, for me to, uh, it enabled me to get the job that I did. And so that's the next step in the path I wanna talk about. Um, I was hired into a biology department at Cal State Stanislaus. And I think, um, I think a lot of my colleagues, current colleagues still don't realize how little training I have in biology. As Vince said, I started in, in earth science and geology. I moved into environmental science and ecology and, and missed um, huge areas of training in biology that really be, is, serves as the core curriculum, I think, for most students who are pursuing biology. So that, I think, has also strongly influenced my approach to pedagogy and my understanding of what aspects of our curriculum are essential and um, what aspects uh, might not be, or we might be able to draw upon other sources of knowledge. So a little bit about uh, Stan State. It's one of the 23 members of the CSU system, Cal State system. One of the smaller campuses, we have about 10,000 students. We're located in the Northern San Joaquin Valley. Um, it's an open access institution. What I mean by that is we admit all students from our service region uh, who meet the college prep requirements uh, in high school or have completed an AA uh, at a community college. And um, uh, the demographics of our, of our student body largely reflect the, um, the demographics of the Northern San Joaquin Valley. Uh, about 50% of our students are Latinx or Hispanic or Chicano. Um, and about three quarters of our students are their first in their family to go to college. And so um, this, our, our student body, we are coming to understand greatly defines who we are as an institution. Um, I really like this, the work um, of Gina Ann Garcia, who really tries to critically analyze what does it mean to be a Latinx serving institution. And she created this model. Um, I think uh, a lot of us who work at HSIs are really struggling with the idea of moving beyond just being a Latinx enrolling institution and really considering what does it mean to be Latinx serving. And I say this also because um, I understand that at Berkeley, this is an aspiration of yours. Um, I've heard becoming an HSI by 2027 is, is the goal. I was, uh, th this is a fraught process and um, I hope I hope all of you are, are thinking carefully about it. I was really pleased with a lot of what was in um, this report on the Chancellor's Task Force. Um, a lot of what was written here was actually pushing for institutional change as opposed to bringing a deficit model uh, about students. Um, and um, I think that's, that's a good thing. <laughs> So I'm gonna be talking today about kind of my understanding of social justice education and what I see about some of the limitations and some of the possibilities within STEM, within science. Um, and again, I say I'm, I'm a learner. I, I'm, I'm not an expert in this issue. I've listed here some of the kind of fields that I've looked towards for inspiration and some of my favorite scholars in this area. And I know that I have many holes in my, in my knowledge. Um, so I'm definitely uh, interested in if you have suggestions for other, other sources of uh, scholarship to consider. My general sense though, is that those of us in, in science and STEM um, who are educators, uh, I think there's just, what I've learned is there's so much work out there uh, that addresses the issues we're facing uh, working with students in our classroom. And for the most part, we've been ignoring it. Um, I think there's so much more that 
we need to do um, to embrace some of the critiques of our disciplines and the ways we've been teaching. And that's, um, that's what I'm gonna be talking to you about today. Some of what I've learned. Um, when I'm talking about you know, books, I have to put in a plug for uh, this book, which just came out a few days ago. I've been voraciously devouring it last few days and can't recommend it highly enough by Dr. Chandra Prescott Weinstein, The Disordered Cosmos. Um, this is you know, gonna be added to my list of essential reading in social justice education. Um, when I'm talking about uh, influences, um, one of the most important in addition to, to these scholars uh, is my, my life partner, uh, Nancy Ao. We've been lucky enough to be co-teaching a class together um, about the past five years, a class that we um, co-designed and created and are teaching together called Writing for Science and Life. Um, so much of my thinking about uh, how to work with students uh, comes from her. Uh, Nancy is a creative writer and she um, has thought really deeply about how we give feedback to students and especially um, how, how the words that we use and the way we interact with students can discourage or encourage students in their learning. Um, and so, so much of her thinking is, is reflected in what I'm sharing with you here today. All right, I've got one more, um, one important source of information uh, and, and that's really influenced my, my thinking about teaching and that's a scholar named uh, Laura Rendon. Uh, in 1994, she proposed validation theory. And um, this is, in, in one way, this is a critique of the idea that students need to adopt the dominant values and norms of academia in order to succeed. Um, it flies in the face of the idea of integration. And it says that academia on our educational institutions, uh, it's our role to validate people as cultural beings and provide opportunities for them to connect their learning with their community, uh, civic engagement, um, activism. So validation theory proposes that there's um, psychosocial environments in classrooms that favor the success of non-traditional or minoritized students, it depends upon empowering, empowerment, um, both from faculty, from staff, from university leadership, really considering the institution as a whole. Um, but I think faculty can really take this to heart, especially uh, faculty such as myself, who are working with a lot of minoritized students and who are working with students who largely, even you know, pre-pandemic pre times, their main a way of interacting with the university was in the class. Most of our students come to school and come to class and then, and then immediately head off campus. And so it's the class itself that really sets the stage for their, um, any sense of belonging that they might develop in the university. And it's these validating experiences that we can foster in a class that can help mitigate the effects of discrimination. Uh, they can help to reduce stereotype threats and they can increase the sense of belonging for students. So I'm, I've heavily drawn upon Laura Rendon's work in validation theory um, and had the chance to work with other faculty uh, in, in STEM fields at Stan State. And together um, we have developed a project that we call Ciencia, which is the Collaboration for Inclusive and Engaging Curriculum Instruction and Achievement. Um, Really this came out of a recognition that um, what was limiting the success of our students was the teaching in introductory science classes. And so the goal of this grant is to transform the culture around teaching and learning in, inter in introductory classes by really asking faculty to, um, to, to reflect on their teaching and consider the ways that a culturally relevant model of teaching might uh, improve students' sense of belonging and engagement in classes. So we're in the third year of this project and it's, um, I think it's, it's, it's been a really exciting process as well as a frustrating process anytime you're trying to do culture change. Um, I also, of course, need to um, celebrate the work that uh, 
Dr. Tima, Tina Mendez is leading um, in this uh, social online tools collaboration. A number of the team members are here. It's great to see you all. Um, this is also motivated by a similar idea that um, we need to pay attention to, to the social and cultural aspects of the classroom and of our students. We need to pay attention to how our students interact. Um, and you know, when, when we understand there's a lack, a, sense, a lack of sense of belonging, um, it could be due to stereotype threat, it could be due to cultural norm framing. Um, we as, as instructors and as faculty can rethink how, how we encourage collaboration, how we encourage um, social relationships in the classroom. So really excited about where that work is going. Just in the past year, as I continue through, um, you know, some of the influences and the direction of my path, um, just in the past year, I finally, I finally found Laura Vendone's book, um, which came out in 2009, and it's called Senti Pensante Pedagogy, or Sensing Thinking Pedagogy. So this is a big driver of my, of my recent work and my recent thinking, and I wanted to spend a minute talking about it. Um, in this book, uh, Dr. Rendon describes how there are at least seven, what she calls agreements, that define the cultural norms of academic and higher education. And from a critique of those agreements, she develops a pedagogy of senti pensante that challenges these hegemonic agreements and identifies alternative agreements to guide teaching and learning in academia. Um, and she encourages faculty to um, to really rethink how these agreements govern our pedagogy. Um, and she, through this senti pensante pedagogy, she describes an alternative, um, what she calls an alternative educational dream field that is integrative, transdisciplinary, and affirming of the dignity of all people. So um, I've been thinking about these and working with these and seeing how they apply in my own work and in my colleagues' work in, in the sciences. Um, I think the way that these, that these agreements work in STEM are, are, are true. Uh, all of these, I think, highly apply, but I think there are some unique interactions that happen when we start considering individual disciplines. And that's, and that's the direction I'm going. That's what I'm gonna be talking about the rest of the time here today. Um, the uh, epistemology of most STEM fields is rooted in the ideas of objective knowledge and empiricism. And um, it, it, it's, you know, are essential to, to, I think, who we are as scientists. These are worldviews that we bring not just to our science, but to other areas of our work, including education. But potentially, um, I think we need to foster a greater awareness of how these ways of viewing the world influence how we teach and how we interact with people. And so, um, I wanted to encourage you just to think about this idea for a minute and share your, share your thoughts. Um, what are the privileged agreements in your discipline? Are there dominant views that people hold that influence not just the research that you do, but also how you teach? So I wonder if you could um, share your thoughts in the chat. I'll give you about a minute.
Thank you, everyone. This is wonderful. So much of what you wrote, um, I'm, I'm resonating with. Um, thank you. Oh, just a reminder uh, or a question, uh, Mateo, I hope I could get a copy of this chat uh, once the session is done. It'd be really helpful to me. Yeah, thank you. This is, you're all sharing ideas that, that I've been thinking about as well. Um, but there's some wonderful new insights here as well. So I, I, I agree. Um, I think that a lot of the teaching practices that we use in STEM are problematic because it's, they reflect these broader hegemonic cultural norms related to competition, related to you know, individualistic learning, solitary work, the idea that academic success is um, just due to natural ability, the idea that science is the domain of white men. Um, and I think these norms affect people of all career stages. Uh, in science, but I think it's especially important we consider how undergraduate students um, are uh, understand these cultural norms. So um, I've been trying to like narrow these ideas down, and I, and I've identified three privileged agreements in that I see as being fundamental in STEM. I think. Uh, for today, I'm just going to focus on this first one, the culture of positivism. And um, I've been thinking a lot about how these agreements influence different aspects of undergraduate education. I think I'm mainly going to talk about today about how the culture of positivism influences STEM pedagogy and curriculum. And I may be able to touch on the uh, GRFP graduate fellowship program a bit as well here today. So, and I want to recognize that um, we're, I don't even know what to say about the time that we're living in right now. Um, but, you know, we have, we, there's, there's the need to, for people to demonstrate and to, to affirm that, that science is an important way to generate understandings about the world. Um, so this is a precarious time, I understand, for science, um, for truth. <laughs> for knowledge, for rationality. Um, I wanna acknowledge that. And I also wanna acknowledge that uh, I think we can also make a space to, to offer up some of these critiques. But I wanted to make sure I, I stated that um, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting we, we throw out everything. Um, so positivism, I, I wanna start with positivism. Positivism is a philosophical approach to knowledge that is essential to the scientific process. So we use information derived from sensory experience and we interpret that information through reason and logic to advance our understanding of the world. Um, I'm gonna be largely drawing upon uh, a critique of this culture of positivism by uh, Henry Giroux. So I would call you to his book, uh, on critical pedagogy, chapter one, where he talks about this. He is particularly um, applying this idea to look at um, to look at history and the discipline in the social sciences and consider why it feels like uh, there's been less attention on history. But I think a lot of these critiques we can also apply to STEM as well. Um, so he says the culture of positive, positivism is different from positivism. Uh, whereas positivism is a philosophical approach to gaining knowledge, the culture of positivism is a form of cultural hegemony. It's a material force, a set of material practices that are embedded in the routines and experiences of our daily lives. So I think this is especially true for, for scientists. Um, we're used to approaching problems with this mindset 
and we tend to carry that with us when we apply it to other things, when we apply it to it uh, to human and social situations and cultural situations as well, and, and education and teaching. So a central component of a culture of positivism is the idea of objectivism, which um, privileges data as something that's distanced from social and cultural forces that help to produce it. Another way to say this would be um, facts form uh, at the core of all forms of knowledge, but it, it creates a tunnel vision by focusing just on facts. It doesn't allow us to question social, political, economic uh, structures that shape the creation of those facts. So, um, for example, like opportunities to consider how different people or cultures may understand some aspect of the natural world, such as plants, let's say, in different historical contexts. Those, those questions are off the table when we're taking a purely uh, objectivist lens within this hegemonic culture of positivism, because there's one set of facts around plants, and those are the facts that teachers must transfer to students. So knowledge becomes not only countable, knowledge then becomes not only countable and measurable, it also becomes impersonal. Teaching in this pedagogical paradigm is usually discipline based and treats subject matter in a compartmentalized and atomized fashion. So this certainly resonates with my own experience in undergraduate uh, education, especially with the pedagogies that we tend to use in STEM classes. We see this in the way many faculty um, start thinking about a, a course. The first two things in my mind that many faculty think of is number one, what topics am I going to cover? In other words, what facts am I going to compartmentalize and present to students? And number two, I think faculty tend to immediately think about what is the grading structure? How many points am I going to assign for exams, for homework, for other assessments? So this is another way of privileging, privileging data and recognizing that we can you know, quantify learning um, based on how many points students get. So I was, that was a lot, I know. I wanna take a break here and, and ask you to think about this a little bit, a minute. Um, I, I've been characterizing this culture of positivism, although I'm differentiating it from how we use positivism in science, but I wanna ask you, um, does this, when you think about the science that you do, do you think the culture of positive, positivism and objectivism are present in the work you do? Is there just one understanding of your science? Um, I immediately think about um, wave particle duality, right? The more we've learned about the natural world, we, we realize that there's not just one way to characterize it. So um, if you have any thoughts about that, by all means, share it in the chat. Is there anything in your field where there's, you know, multiple ways to understand uh, a topic, a concept that require putting on a different lens? Nice, yeah, I'm talking about viruses a lot right now in general biology. I've been talking to Tina about how I'm teaching uh, an upper division ecology for the first time in many years and how much work that is. But one of the things I love about it is this idea that there's these different levels of ecology. We can look out the window and we can look um, at a plant from an organismal ecology perspective and think about its adaptations and how it interacts around water relations and, uh, and temperature. And then we can put on this whole other lens of uh, community ecology. And that same plant, we can think about uh, interactions uh, in the food web. Interesting, interesting.
So as I'm part of the March for Science, I was um, captivated by this statement um, by Robin Wall Kimmerer and other indigenous scientists. They're calling for recognition really that there's not a singular science, that there are multiple ways of learning about the world using positivist approaches, um, evidence-based approaches in particular that there are indigenous ways of knowing that are both scientific and help us expand be beyond a much narrow, uh, narrow vision of Western science. So, uh, love that one. So, um, yeah, this past year, I've been thinking a lot about this, and it's been running up against how we've been teaching um, during the pandemic. And kind of my working hypothesis at this point is that I think the culture of positivism, which obviously came out of, of how we do our science, it now exerts greater hegemonic control, not just in the science we do, but in the realm of STEM education. And so even as we're getting better at recognizing the myth of uh, objectivity in the sciences, that there's one way to know the world, I feel like, in, especially in undergraduate STEM education, we continue to fall back on this culture of positivism when we teach. And it's been especially apparent over the last year. Um, and I wanna make it clear that I'm not blaming my colleagues, educators in general, um, for how we've been teaching this past year. This has been a time of um, personal and social catastrophe for, for so many of us. And most faculty will say, and they never wanted to teach online. We were, weren't given enough time. We weren't given training and resources to make this transition. Um, and I totally agree. I guess what I am saying is that I think during times of stress, we tend to fall back on old habits. And in some cases, it can be harder to see beyond the limits of hegemonic structures. Um, whereas in the before times, there might have been opportunity for more creative approaches or experimentation or self-reflection, critical questioning about how we're teaching. Many of us lost that time and that bandwidth um, for the important work that's needed for a more critical pedagogy. Given all that, this is a lot of what I was hearing about from faculty that I was working with. Um, they were concerned about how do I maintain standards? How do I maintain continuity? How do I take what I'm doing in the in-person classroom and bring it online with the least amount of, of problems? How do I continue to fairly assess students on their content knowledge now that they're not in the same room? Now that in a lot of cases, I can't see them, I can't hear them. Um, what are the options in terms of proctoring software? Can I require that students have their camera on? Um, so as, as an example of the, the fair assessments that faculty are trying to do, one example is asking, telling students, requiring them to set up a phone uh, behind them, videoing themselves, taking an exam online um, on, a, on another computer. Um, doing an exam, videotaping, videoing themselves and scanning it and emailing it within a 10 minute window after the end of the exam, um, not offering makeup exams. So there's this hyper awareness of assessment and there's an anxiety about how to do assessment in order to rank students fairly. And all of this takes precedence over um, learning. Um, I think this is a really good example of how this, this need to be objective, this need to collect data and assess has really had a lot of negative consequences on, on students and on learning. These are the things that were not always prioritized. There wasn't always an, a, a goal of maintaining community, of continuing to cultivate a sense of belonging and well being. Um, there was little room for flexibility. There wasn't attention to care and, and trauma. Um, I really like this 
this pedagogical philosophy, start by trusting students by Jesse Salma. Um, if that can be our starting place, as opposed to how do I quote fairly assess, which we know is that fairness is going to translate into inequity. It's going to play upon all the existing inequities and magnify those inequities. Okay. Um, I think, let's see. Okay, time check. Uh, I, th I think I may, I may wrap things up. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip ahead a few slides, a bunch of GRFP stuff. Um, excuse me for one moment while I fast forward. GRFP, GRFP. Um, and I'm going to come back to, to uh, Laura Rendon. Um, this is... Uh, I'm really excited over the next year, I'm, I'm gonna be on sabbatical uh, in the fall and spring for the next academic year. Really looking forward to this time to, uh, to slow down and catch up. Um, and so my, my project is going to be to investigate how educators in STEM um, understand the dominant agreements uh, in their field. Um, so it's gonna be a qualitative research study. I'm gonna be specifically um, trying to interview people who are trying to develop a new pedagogical vision for STEM. Um, some of the outcomes that I'm hoping for uh, is developing a, as co-researchers a collective pedagogical vision for reimagining STEM, looking at um, strategies for change that individuals have implemented, but also thinking about strategies for change at a, at a larger level, at an institutional level. And uh, also looking at what are the impacts of this kind of work on the professional lives of individuals. A lot of times this kind of work is not uh, celebrated. Um, especially I think as you, as for, for people at a, a research focused institution, uh, this might be seen as, as something uh, outside of what the expectations are for your work. So that's some of what I'm hoping to do uh, over the next year. Um, as I mentioned, I'm still at a very early stage, but um, I really appreciate this opportunity to, to share this with you. Um, I hope that uh, some of this resonated. I hope that um, if you're interested, you can you know, reach out to me, um, email, find me on my website, find me on Twitter. Um, love to hear your thoughts about it. And I'd love to open it up to questions or thoughts or reactions or anything. Well, thank you, Matt. This was extremely insightful and interesting. I would like to start off with one thing that I didn't see in your presentation and I speak out of personal experience. Um, you didn't bring up language in your, in, your ish, in your presentation. And I grew up being taught by a dominant language. My family speaks three languages. None of these is a dominant language. So it's not used in the country officially. And it, it goes back to elementary school, um, primary, first and second grade, I was taught in Italian. And it was very difficult because Italian was not any other language, you know. So, I realized later on that also with, with people from my community that are linguistically different from the dominant, that once we started having teachers that actually could speak our language and understand, that really improved things dramatically. And I tell you, I have records, I can, you can look at my homework in first and second grade, it was awful. And then in third grade, the teacher also spoke two of the languages that I spoke, and that made things so much better. So I think when we have some uh, unresolved issues, with large, you know, especially Hispanic communities, we need to include language as well. And that would be a very good argument in favor of, of hiring faculty that also communicates in the, in the native language. And believe me, uh, you know, theoretically, we are, we were tetralingual, but, you know, the language that was, you know, forced upon us was not native to us, but, in, you know, in any me, you know, way, shape or form. And that really penalized our ability to learn. Do you have any thoughts about this or do we need to move away from language um, in the future? Well. Oh, God, no, I think, thank you, Matteo. I think language is incredibly important. I myself am not, don't have the expertise to speak to it the way that you did. Um, it does remind me 
uh, about a lot of the scholarship uh, around um, Hispanic serving institutions, um, especially the, so many of these scholars, um, Laura Rendon and others have um, come from the Rio Grande Valley of uh, South Texas along, along the border. Um, both scientists of, uh, of uh, or STEM scholars, but also you know, social scientists, anthropologists. And um, they talk about being in, in, in classrooms where Spanish was the dominant language um, and how, how important that was. It also reminds me of um, Bell Hooks's work and um, although the it, you know it's 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 not a it's not an issue of a different language, but it's about dialects and it's about other aspects of culture. Um, she talks a lot about how having um, having black teachers from her from her community growing up, and then this the culture clash that happened um, moving into integrated schools. So yeah, the language is essential, but I. Love to hear other thoughts about that. Hi, Matt. This is uh, Robin. I, I had hey, Robin. I had a question that kind of piggybacks off Mateo's point, which I deeply resonate and value. Uh, and maybe this could uh, intersect with the work and the commentary you have around the GFRP, uh, which I have my own deep-seated opinions about. But the idea of language and not having access to people who speak the same dialect or same way or communicate science the same way that you speak it and understand it does pose a significant barrier for people who are applying for these competitive grants like the NSF GFRP. Um, I know from my personal experience, similar to what Mateo was sharing, personal experience, my personal experience with GFRP, it took a foundation for me to finally uh, understand I, I need to find a balance between my voice and seriously, you know, if you could offer any opinions or thoughts about how that may issue of language comes up with the GFRP or other competitive grants, how that does present exclusionary practices. Yeah, the, uh, missed just a little bit of that at the end, Robin, but I heard, um, I heard, yeah, thinking about language in your own application and how that might come up uh, as applications are reviewed. Yeah, um, yeah, part of it, if, if we'd had more time uh, talking about the GRFP, um, I've served as a reviewer for a few times on the GRFP. Um, they ask us not to talk about any, any details of the review process. And so I'm gonna abide by that. But I will say, um, I would be really, I'd be really concerned uh, if, if other reviewers were um, bringing up language, bringing up grammar in their reviews. But I expect that that, that ha happens a lot. Um, I would be really concerned if a reviewer was to um, make a comment about how uh, an applicant uses, you know, multiple forms of their name in their application and, and use that as a, as a critique that requires explanation. Um, yeah, that, that, I think all of this falls into, of course, the, the expectation for who a scientist should be and what their path should look like. Um, I'd, I'd be, you know, equally concerned if uh, a reviewer brought up a comment that a, an applicant needs to explain why it took them, you know, six years to get their undergraduate degree and, and see that as a negative. And I think about, you know, a, a student I had who was fully enrolled in every spring term and, and took the fall term off in order to work, you know, full-time 12 hour shifts as a supervisor in a tomato canning plant throughout the whole summer and fall. Um, yeah, I think this is all aspects of, of bias that really require more attention. Um, 
Yeah, thanks, Robin. And I like Rosalie's comment in the chat. Language is more than grammar, it's voice. This is something that, that we, we think a lot about in the class that I teach with, um, with my partner, Nancy. Um, and it's, you know, we, we, we have to make space for people to write and communicate uh, using their own voice, 100%. And, and that gets shut down so much in academia. So that's something that we absolutely make space for. Um, and I think, yeah, we need to, especially in the sciences, right? Where our, it, our job is not to teach grammar. Our, our job is to teach critical thinking uh, and applying the scientific method and, and working with evidence. Um, it's not our role to police, to police grammar and police language and voice. As someone who has now GSI'd the last two semesters during these uh, Zoom times, I just wanted to say that I really appreciated what you had to say about the pedagogical goals. Um, I, I feel like there's, especially in kind of group teaching environments, there's often so much tension about what priority should be and how to equally serve all the students without giving legs up and all these ridiculous things. But um, it was really nice to see this layout of what goals should be in terms of just like caring first and foremost. Um, so it felt very, very nice because it's been a hard thing for me recently. Thank you. I'm sure, yeah, Alexandra. Um, yeah, I know teachers have been saying the same thing. And so I, I yeah, empathize with your situation, especially I imagine, uh, I remember being a GSI for bio two and other classes and um, yeah, feeling like, you know, you're, you're wanting to help your students um, you have that personal relationship with them. Uh, you're also this, this cog in this machine that is this 1000 person class. And there's, there's a lot of constraints on what you can do. So I hear you there. Okay, we have time for one more question or comment. Don't be shy. Can I ask you what else you'll do on your sabbatical? Do you have field work plans? Is that a Any other question? fun stuff or traveling? Oh, yeah, that's kind yeah, of a question. Because you know, you're gonna I think you're gonna be doing a lot of deep reading, even though you're on sabbatical, because you seem to have a very big stack of literature that you're you're thinking about all the time, um, but I was just kind of curious if you're gonna, how you're gonna fit all those pieces together to take yeah. a break, but also keep thinking, right? Oh yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, so th this is the, the PUI, the primarily undergraduate institution life. I mean, the field work is, is taking a break. Like that's the fun that happens on the weekends <laughs> for sure. I'll be out in Curry Canyon for sure. Well, thank you, everyone. I really appreciate um, all your attention and your questions and your comments. It was really, really so lovely to see so many of you. Um, thank you, Vince. Thank you, Tina, Justin, Kelly. And there's Kyle. Okay, well, thank you, Matt. Thank you. <laughs> there was a, it's like the Oscar. <laughs> so, well, thank you. It takes a lot of guts um, to to talk so candidly like you did, and we really appreciate it. It was it was uh, really from the heart, and um, also really food for thought for all of us. So thank you very much, and um, you will have. Uh, I'll, I'll send you. Actually, the we'll we'll post this chat because it's so important. I think to understand your presentation, and we also send it to you. And again, I wanted to thank you all for being here, and hope to see you the same place at the same time next week for Christine Sprunger. Thank you again, Matt, and thanks all for participating. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks.